Okay, good morning, noon or night, whatever it might be that you're watching this presentation on demand with respect to the Confrontation Clause. Uh, my name is Justin McShane. I'll be your presenter today. I'm a Harrisburg-based uh, attorney who specializes in using forensic science for the benefit of the citizen among us who's accused. What I'd like to do today is present you with some thoughts about the Confrontation Clause, taking a look at the uh, developed jurisprudence primarily from the uh, Supreme Court of the United States um, in its, uh, its cases leading up to today about confrontation and taking a look at not only the historical developments, the historical facts, and also the, uh, the, the holdings of, of the court, uh, but also taking a look at it from a practical point of view, from a trial attorney point of view, as far as what arguments work and what arguments don't work. So the first thing to understand is that the Confrontation Clause is not that complicated. The text itself is very short and simple and to the point, um, and there's very little equivocation in it. But like most things in law, we lawyers seem to make uh, practice out of making very simple things horribly complex. And that's no difference with the Confrontation Clause. But the good news is that it is simple by way of its design. It's simple in its modern-day understanding of its jurisprudence. It's very simple to understand. It just takes some work to understand it and to be exposed to it. You know, you can go back over and you can take a look at the history of how the Confrontation Clause, or modern understanding of it, has developed. One of the first places that would be suggested to take a look at is the 1603 trial of Sir Walter Raleigh. And in that trial, it was a trial for treason. Uh, there was the main piece of evidence was an affidavit that was produced instead of a live witness in the trial by Lord Cobham, and uh, who was really Henry Brooke, and later was rewarded for his uh, affidavit and his testimony and other good acts uh, by the king by becoming the 11th Baron, Baron uh, Corp. And uh, what happened in that trial is repeatedly Sir Walter Raleigh uh, demanded that the crown, who was prosecuting him, bring forth uh, Henry Brooke for the purposes of confronting him and be able to cross-examine him. The frustration that Sir Walter Raleigh had was that there was a piece of paper that was sworn to in front of uh, the ecclesiastical uh, clerical church, um, and that was accepted as proof positive in the main proof that was presented against him without the opportunity to uh, cross-examine and probe the veracity and the validity of the conclusions, the statements, and the observations that were put in it. So it was out of that modern, uh, quasi-modern uh, situation in 1603 that we have the development of the idea of the Confrontation Clause. It was uh, further developed and presented uh, beginning uh, pre-Constitution in the seminal case of 1696 uh, with the precedent over in England of uh, Rex v. Payne. After the Constitution, there was uh, quite a bit of litigation um, to a degree from the Supreme Court of the United States having to do with what amounts to confrontation for purposes of our Constitution. And that would start with the Kirby case, go all the way through Maddox into Douglas. But you know, the truth of the matter is, um, from a trial attorney's point of view, who really cares about all of that history? Those are things that are beyond our control, beyond our understanding, and in, while nice in the historical context, really isn't where the, where the uh, rubber meets the road, so to speak, uh, for today's trial attorneys. And while it's important, and I would commend you to take a look at all the briefings that have to go on uh, with all of these cases, because there's some fabulous historical accounts, especially from the various professors, um, with respect to the historical framework of the Confrontation Clause, um, from a trial lawyer's point of view, that kind of is superfluous, nice knowledge, but not necessary for us to understand. What is necessary for us as trial attorneys, whether you're prosecution and defense, is how this effectively works in the real world, or the way that it should work according to the Supreme Court of the United States. And what I really like to do is I have a belief that uh, absolutely mimics Einstein's thoughts, which is if you can't explain something simply, then you really don't understand it. That's what he said. And my way that I like to take a look at things is if you can't put it on one piece of paper, to explain it to someone to where it makes sense and they can understand it, then it's really kind of worthless. The knowledge is worthless. 
So what I want to do is offer to anyone who cares this confrontation clause chart as a way of a decision tree, if you will, as far as whether or not the confrontation clause uh, by itself, and this is an examination of exclusively the confrontation clause, is offended or not offended uh, by the actions of the prosecution. As we will talk about later on, we have to remember and always keep in mind, for those of you who are not uh, lawyers who may be watching this, that there is no equivalent right of the government to confront witnesses. The confrontation rights uh, that are embedded in the United States Constitution are for the accused and for witnesses against them. And so in other words, uh, the, it is an uneven playing field when it comes to it, uh, the constitutional concepts, the federal constitutional concepts of the Confrontation Clause. So the first thing before you even take a look at this uh, sheet of paper, or this particular uh, schema, is to determine whether or not the government is truly offering into evidence. If they are, then you just start in the upper left-hand corner with the paramount question, uh, which is, is it testimonial? And what is testimonial it seems to be where the courts spend a lot of time and where there's a lot of litigation, and it's really a um, hotbed of activity. And the hotbed of activity circles around this idea and this notion that was formalized in Bryant, Michigan versus Bryant, which is the primary purpose rule or primary purpose of the litigation rule. And what that basically stands for, if I can put it up very simply, is but for the, inv but for the invention of the criminal justice system, would this statement, would this opinion, would this piece of evidence ever have been generated? So, but for the invention of the criminal justice system, would it have existed? And that's to be distinguished from outside use that's there in order to determine whether or not it is for uh, another ulterior purpose that has a primary purpose outside of the instant litigation, meaning the criminal prosecution that's going on right now. And this is where we get back to the ideas of the 911 phone calls and really how simple if you just start here and take a look at a 911 phone call. A 911 phone call is generally made by someone to report an ongoing present emergency and particularly the way to take a look at that is to take a look at the tense of the verb of the person who's making the report. If it were something along the lines of there's a shooter in the, uh, in the college square, we need help. The primary purpose of the person who's making that phone call isn't to furthering the investigation of the shooter or the alleged shooter uh, on the campus, but rather to get help immediately now. And so if you take a look at from that point of view, the primary purpose isn't the litigation, but that ongoing emergency. And so therefore, it is outside of the uh, primary purpose rule as formalized by Michigan versus Bryant. And that's in, indeed the example that I'm giving is the Davis example. However, I would enjoy the perspective that uh, Justice Scalia points to in his dissent of that very case, where he talks about the tense of the verb being the important part of it. For example, if instead there was a situation where there was an active ongoing shooter, and then several hours later there was a newscast that says, we need help reassembling what happened here today in this tragedy with this active shooter that went on. Please call into 911 so you can give us your statement. People call into 911 then. Their primary purpose is not to report an ongoing emergency. Their primary purpose in doing so is to give historical facts that would be eventually used in prosecution. Another example of how this all works is the example of uh, hospital blood in the context of a DUI. Now, what we have to do is we have to really understand what goes on with respect to hospital blood uh, testing for purposes of ETOH or ethanol concentration. For example, if it was a true trauma situation where the person was really, really messed up, for example, soft tissue trauma, hard tissue trauma, came in unconscious uh, to the emergency room, and as part of uh, the truly needed treatment program to diagnose this unconscious person who can't report things, uh, they did a series of blood draws, not just one, uh, 
uh, in, to discover what the person's blood alcohol content is. If the primary purpose in doing so was truly for the purposes of diagnosis, diagnosis, treatment, and care, as opposed to defensive medicine, as opposed to prosecutorial uh, necessities or direction, then it would be outside the framework of confrontation, and confrontation wouldn't be offended by the introduction through some sort of hearsay exception primarily uh, to uh, get that into evidence. Now, what we have to do is be careful that not all blood draws done in a trauma situation are for the true primary purpose of diagnosis. For example, if there is one blood draw and one blood draw alone, and that discovers ethanol, then that might be part of a routine procedure that is really a kind of a disguise for uh, use of future prosecution. And so what we would look for in that circumstance is if it was truly needed for treatment and diagnostic purposes, we would look for different blood draws over different periods of time. We call that serial blood draws, so way it can be used as a valid measurement. So we can't just simply sit there and say that because it was done in a hospital setting, therefore it's, it's, uh, it's dismissed as not being something that affronts the confrontation clause. For example, in some places in the United States, uh, the blood draw and the analysis is done uh, at the behest of uh, the prosecution at the hospital itself and the person isn't admitted, isn't being treated, and isn't being uh, diagnosed at all. And it's just literally the person is arrested in the most convenient place for the blood draw and the analysis is done at the hospital itself. In that case, simply being in the setting of a hospital is not enough. Uh, in fact, it would be the sole purpose in that particular case for the litigation would be um, uh, a, it would be a total affront to the confrontation clause if it was uh, let in without the particular witness being present. So that's to give you some ideas of how to take a look at this primary purpose rule and to see some real life examples of how it uh, essentially in my opinion is pretty straightforward and pretty easy to understand. Now the next level that's there because you just don't stop at the discovery of whether or not it's for the primary purpose of litigation. Next thing that you look to do is to say, um, did the accused have a meaningful prior opportunity to cross-examine the witness? And what that means is, is there an opportunity for the person to be cross-examined and either the person decided not to by waiving the hearing, such as a preliminary hearing, or by way of a forfeiture, or by way of some other rubric that the opportunity was like a, like a deposition, for example. Uh, that's that first level that's there. But if you, you can't just stop right there because there's other requirements. And the other requirements is that, that even if the person had a prior meaningful opportunity to cross-examine the witness, it must be done under oath and in the presence of the accused. And in my uh, short career down in Florida, I, I, I've been involved in felony depositions down there. They are under oath, but they're not typically in the presence of the accused. So you would have some difficulties, I would suggest, with this uh, decision tree if later on the person would become unavailable because it wasn't made in the presence of the accused. I suppose that an argument could be made that the uh, presence of the accused would be waived by uh, the trial counsel taking the deposition, but that would be a fact-specific uh, determination by the judge to see what's there. But nevertheless, it's a conjunctive instead of a disjunctive notion that it must be un under oath and in the presence of the accused. The reason why presence is in parentheses is because it is yet to be settled, uh, although there is some guidance from the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, what this presence requirement means. Um, and there's a Maryland case on point that says in the case of uh, a, child, uh, a child witness who would be shown to have psychological trauma that a short circuit camera um, could be employed uh, to get around this. However, there's some significant thoughts that maybe this uh, notion of the videotaped or video linked um, uh, not in the presence is, is certainly something that would be litigated and I suggest it will be litigated in terms of whether or not presence and what the, what the penumbra 
of the acceptable conduct would constitute that presence type of requirement. Then you don't just stop there. What you do next is you have to look at relayed into evidence by the particular witness who made the original statement. And that's what we come down to the particular witness rule. And that's what really this rest of this kind of uh, presentation will focus on is uh, the particular witness rule as uh, encapsulated in most recently in the Bullcoming versus New Mexico case. And that is the person who generated uh, the information is the person who has to come in court and present it. Now, when you take a look at all of these things that are there, of course, if you have a person, if you have the particular witness who generated the information, who is under oath, in the presence of the accused, in the courtroom, and subject to meaningful cross-examination, and there is, there can be no, by definition, there can be no confrontation clause issue because the person is live there in court. What becomes the other issue is what happens in the case of uh, someone who died. Um, and, and that's a very interesting uh, concept that comes to play because what you have to do is move over to the Giles versus California, which is that right-hand side uh, determination, which is did the accused purposely act to preclude this prior meaningful opportunity to cross-examine? That comes typically in two different ways. Number one is going, uh, three different ways. Number one is going on the lam. For example, that uh, you were given notice of a hearing, uh, and they could prove actual notice that's beyond dispute of that hearing, and you decided not to show up, to go on the lam, go on the run, and to have, for example, a warrant against you. Arguably, that could be a forfeiture kind of by, by way of wrongdoing type of situation. Or number two is if you, uh, in the case of forensic science, if you kill the analyst, which uh, would be horrible, but um, if you were to kill the analyst or give them a around the trip, you know, around the world trip uh, for free, and you were to make them unavailable due to your own actions, then you have a, a question as far as whether or not you have purposefully acted to preclude this prior meaningful opportunity to cross-examine. So as you can see, it's a multiple variable type of situation. But I think with this decision tree then what we can do is we can take a look at it simply and just take any given episode and run it straight through to see whether or not it offends or does not offend the Confrontation Clause. Now, the, what is important to remember uh, is the entire kind of purpose that's developed with the Confrontation Clause. The requirement that the accused be allowed to address the particular witness who generated the testimonial statement is intended to serve four primary functions. It is suggested by Jeff Fisher. Uh, number one, it enables the meaningful cross-examination of the particular witness's factual allegations that give rise to the testimonial assertions. So not just the assertions themselves, or the conclusions, or the opinions themselves, but the underlying facts that the person relies upon. That's one of the purposes of the uh, of the prime of the confrontation clause. The second one is it guarantees that the particular witness who generated the testimonial assertions sought to be admitted gives his or her testimony under oath. And of course there is still the notion uh, that a person who is under oath would be potentially subject to perjury in prosecution if they were to be found to be untruthful. So that is one of the other main purposes of the Confrontation Clause. The third one is it allows the fact finder to observe what the witness's demeanor and the responses to questions posed by the accused. Because everyone knows someone, I mean it's relatively simple to write a beautiful report. I've seen many times police reports or even witness statements involving uh, witnesses for the defense, because I'm a criminal defense attorney, that look beautiful on a piece of paper. But then that same person who's subjected to either direct examination sometimes or cross-examination most of the time will have hesitancy, will have doubt, will equivocate and not be, uh, not be effective. There's a far sight difference also in vocal intonation and inflection which is not covered by a transcript. Pauses, for example. A court reporter seldom, if ever, will record that there is a pause or hesitation or stutter and those things can go and be important in a given context to give flavor to the testimony, to give credibility or lack thereof 
of the testimony. It's a far sight different saying something sheepishly than saying something with great amount of confidence and a great amount of, of vigor. So those are one of the important historical notes of the purpose of the Confrontation Clause. And the fourth one, it assures that the particular witness testifies in the presence of the accused. Because it is hard, it is sometimes hard for people to point out the wrongdoer with, when they have a, an evil heart. And that's what the original idea of being confronted with your accuser was, was that you had to look the person in the eye and that the person would look you back in the eye and then you would see whether or not the person would be able to carry through with their accusation. The particular witness is important because conduits or surrogate witnesses don't have the underlying facts or information. Uh, they are relying upon the reports of others. It would be no different than a police officer. In, let's just say that there was a, a robbery case. A police officer relating what another person told them in terms of identification versus the particular person who gave the police officer information. This totem pole kind of hearsay notion is incorporated and is part of the Confrontation Clause. The reason why it's so important to understand the Confrontation Clause, particularly from a criminal defense attorney's point of view, is that the day and age, I would suggest, of smoke and mirrors and shell games and you know, hide the pee and it turns out to be in, under none of those uh, walnut shells, is, day, is completely done and over with. Um, juries see past it. You can't baffle them with BS anymore, in my opinion. Uh, in my opinion, again, the presumption of innocence and the burden of proof uh, being on the prosecution, both in terms of production and persuasion, is uh, for all intents and purposes, and probably has for a long time, been a, uh, a, a legal fiction or a myth. And instead, what's required is for the defense to prove something, uh, improve innocence or prove uh, reasonable doubt, rather than it coming out of the lack of evidence. So the day and age of sitting there and trying to play shell games, and for example, in the case of uh, any sort of forensic science-related uh, matter, sitting there and standing in front of a jury and saying, well, this gizmo over here, um, you know, I don't understand how it can give us a blood alcohol content, for example, just by breathing into it, and that being your main thrust of your defense is it's over and it's done with. It's gone. It's like dinosaurs or dodo birds. It's, it was present. It's been historically proven, but um, it's no longer the modern uh, world. So what we have to do as criminal defense attorneys, and what I would suggest for prosecutors even, is to evolve. And for both sides, uh, what ends up having to happen is you have to uh, not occupy Wall Street or occupy Main Street, but really occupy the crime lab. Now, I don't mean that in a literal sense, where we go in there and, like the Occupy movement does, and camp inside the crime lab and refuse to allow work to be done. But what I mean by that is to learn the science, embrace the science, understand the science, become educated in the science, because that's how justice best results, is by way of educated people making educated decisions. And for decades upon decades upon decades, and even through to the present, the people who are making the decisions, whether they be prosecutors or, or defense attorneys, as far as whether or not a case needs to be litigated and needs to go to trial, and then ultimately, uh, are ultimately well under, you know, com completely and fundamentally uninformed of how science works. And that is not how justice results, I suggest. The heat of this problem, the, 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 the true problem, is one of education. It's of understanding. And it really is incumbent upon both sides to not just, uh, under, not just take the word of a technician, not just take a word of an expert, but to be empowered to understand that which the technician or the expert is relying, relaying to us uh, from the data to make our own independent decisions uh, and that's how justice truly comes to be. And we can better screen these types of cases to understand um, whether these things are, are, need to be litigated, whether or not they need to be dealt or dismissed. And so being involved with the science, understanding the science, taking the time to be up-educated on the science is a paramount requirement, I would suggest, uh, 
for all criminal law practitioners, regardless if you're a prosecution, prosecution or defense. It is especially needed for defense attorneys, and uh, we need to become better educated. Because the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter how complicated or simplistic the process is, that what at the end of the day, in all forms of forensic science, is an expression of an opinion. It may be an educated opinion, it may be based upon some sort of empirical research or empirical data, but it is interpretive and it is an opinion. It might be pursuant to a validated method based upon a stable instrument with a well-trained operator with a great uh, software system package, but at the end of the day it is still an opinion. No matter how you, whatever you may think of in terms of a process, it is still an opinion. It is not as simple as an adding calculator, such as the one that's here. An adding calculator is a, a beautifully simplistic thing, where you walk up to it. I walk up to it, I hit 1 plus 1, it equals 2. You walk up to it, 1 plus 1 equals 2. My daughter, who's 3 years old, baby Mia, she walks up to it, 1 plus 1, it'll always equal 2. The field's medal winner, the person who is decided by the mathematics world, to be the best mathematician for this year, who's awarded that prestigious medal, walks up to it, 1 plus 1 it equals 2. And that, my friends, is the myth of forensic science as postulated in court here these days, when it's not true. It just simply isn't. For those of you who practice forensic science, you know this is not true, because there's always, uh, there's always an opinion at the bottom of it. Take, for example, one of the most empirical types of tests that are available, that are out there, and that, that I can think of, is gas chromatography uh, with mass spectrometry. There is a spectrum that's produced that may be empirical, that is based upon the steps that precede it. It depends upon what type of mass analyzer you're using, uh, the source, whether it's CI versus EI, or the detector that's used, and the mass analyzer, whether it's time of flight, or else if it's a triple quad or a single quad, and what the various settings are that are produced with the DC and the RF energy, for example, uh, that goes through, whether it's in scan mode or SIM mode, whether you're looking at a tick or a SIM. But the bottom line of it is that it's part of this process. But where it becomes really important is when you have that spectrum of the unknown at the end. Then you're comparing against the standard. Very rarely do the two match up, and probably shouldn't match up, to where there's a match factor score of 100, or 1,000, rather. Uh, 1,000, meaning that it's a perfect match. That sometimes it's, it's, it's much lower, considerably lower. And so you have this hit list on the left-hand side of your NIST uh, search, or whatever library you're using that gives the top 100. And you have the match factors, the quality scores, and then you have the probability percentages. And so what you're really doing there is you're doing an exercise of discretion and reporting it out because it's not a perfect match. And so therefore, even with that particular device, um, which is probably the most empirical one that I can think of right now as I'm sitting here talking to you, it's still an exercise of discretion. It's still an exercise of opinion. And so that's really why the confrontation clause, I suggest, exists in this modern day. It's to allow the confrontation or the questioning of the validity of the reported result. Now, what we have to do is we have to understand that there's competing interests that go along here. And there's at least three, and at the end of this presentation I'll present maybe a fourth, um, that goes along to see whether or not something's admissible. There are three competing interests that sometimes and very limitedly overlap. The first competing interest is by way of evidentiary hearsay exceptions. And what those are, are your excited utterances, your business records, um, and your uh, excuse for using um, statements from out of court, meaning things that people are not physically present to say into the record. The second competing interest is the Constitutional Confrontation Clause requirements, which is what we've been talking about. As you can see from the simple Venn diagram, that the two are not completely overlapping. They're not completely uh, coterminous with one another. That there is a place of overlap. 
And then the third competing interest that I would suggest is the rules of evidence, whether it be 403 simple relevance or 602 personal knowledge. And it's the combination of these three areas that leads to the sliver of what amounts to totally admissible evidence. Now, how wide that area is, is totally dependent upon either your state rules, but is absolutely governed by the Supreme Court of the United States. Because as you can remember, that the Supreme Court in the United States sets the minimum threshold of requirements. No state can go under that, um, but states can heighten that. So your particular state and its interpretation of these three intermixing parts can either make that, that sweet spot of admissible evidence smaller or larger, depending upon uh, its developed case law. Now, what we have to understand is that in the grand scheme of things, you need to have, I would suggest, all three of these things present. But when there's a push or a shove that comes to be, constitutional confrontation clause-based rights always win. The reason why they always win is because they are constitutional in nature. Evidentiary hearsay exceptions and rules of evidence-based uh, 403 and 602 understandings, those types of things are either state-created uh, by their state Supreme Court, by a rules committee, or by way of uh, the federal rules of evidence, which is also done by way of, of basically committee. Um, those things will always be subservient to any sort of constitutional precept. So the Confrontation Clause is the ripe focus for a lot of this, because if you can't satisfy a confrontation, you don't even have to worry about hearsay, because that particular piece of evidence will be left out. No amount of evidentiary hearsay exceptions or compliance with 403 or 602 will overcome uh, a problem with the Confrontation Clause. And the reason why I know these things are different and are not totally subsumed with one another is based upon this exchange by Justice Scalia that I would offer to you at this point. Well, I'll go You're further. You're objecting right? to hearsay, are you, counsel? You're objecting to a violation of the Confrontation Clause, That's which right. is quite different from what, uh, what Mr. Whitmore was writing about, which was hearsay. Yeah, but Whitmore actually believed that the Confrontation Clause simply encapsulated the hearsay rule. We've that said the mean, contrary, though, haven't yeah, we? I'm, I'm asking you the question. And, I, and, and so what we have there is Justice Breyer sparring with uh, Justice Scalia, which are probably the two polemics in this Confrontation Clause. And what Scalia said is that um, the, the notions of confrontation and the notions of hearsay are totally independent of one another, while they might overlap, such as our Venn diagram here, that one does not solve the other. Justice Breyer's counter-argument was that Wigmore, in his treatises, has identified uh, that hearsay is totally subsumed within confrontation. And as Scalia, I would suggest, rightfully points out, uh, through these cases that have recently come out over the last several years, there has been an absolute distinction uh, between these two concepts that satisfying a uh, evidentiary um, rule of hearsay does not necessarily solve your confrontational confrontation related issue and its requirements. So as I mentioned I'm a trial attorney and because I'm a trial attorney I like to be practical and all this stuff that we've been talking about recently I would suggest is useful to understand and essential to understand but where the rubber meets the road, you need to be aware of loser arguments that are out there, things that just will not work or should not work, either with your trial judge or appellate justices uh, that determine whether or not there is confrontation. Now, I'll start with uh, some no-brainers. And what is absolutely a no-brainer is to postulate some sort of idea of true and literal confrontation. And what I mean by that is that the only admissible evidence is if the person is present in the courtroom. So that would be as if there was no um, primary purpose rule whatsoever. And the literal text of the Constitution, as it is written, was enacted, which meant that the, every witness would have to be present in the courtroom. And this is clearly not true. Uh, if you're a criminal defense attorney and you're trying to advance that, then um, as, as a solution or as your argument, 
you should lose every single time. What you have to do is you have to understand there's the primary purpose rule and what that primary purpose rule stands for. So true and literal confrontation is a loser argument. Another type of loser argument uh, is the chicken little style of argument, um, and that has to go from, you know, uh, along this type of quote, that the confrontation clause and enforcing it as it's been uh, litigated since uh, the beginning with Crawford and through Melendez-Diaz into Bullcoming um, will cause a shutdown of the criminal justice system, shut down labs, and set the guilty free. I call that the chicken little argument. And the reason why that doesn't work is because of really basically um, two points of view. Uh, number one, from a global perspective, since those holdings, Crawford, Melendez-Diaz, and then ultimately to Bullcoming, uh, while we have seen um, anecdotal in, in information that the number of subpoenas have gone up for crime laboratories to comply with for physical presence, even in notice and demand type of places, the sky has not fallen. The guilty are still being convicted, and uh, and so it hasn't it hasn't been the doomsday device that the prosecutions and the National District Attorneys Association has been uh, arguing would happen. It just hasn't materialized. It's not likely to materialize uh, because the truth of the matter is it goes back to one of the original slides that was up there. Most criminal defense attorneys don't understand this stuff, and that's a real shame. And uh, generally speaking, they don't understand that, that, these, uh, that these conclusory reports are really opinion or subject to some level of scrutiny in front of the trier of fact. If they knew that, then maybe we'd have a different position than that which we find ourselves in today. But the truth of the matter is that most of the time, uh, for example, solid drug dose or pre-consumption form prosecution for controlled substances, uh, the, the Melendez-Diaz slash bullcoming requirement for the particular witness has absolutely not resulted in those cases being uh, unable to be prosecuted uh, because most of the time defense attorneys, for whatever reason, um, decide to stipulate uh, to the opinion uh, that's formed as a conclusion. So uh, from a global perspective, uh, it hasn't materialized. And number two, the most important reason is a practical reason, is that um, the Supreme Court of the United States just doesn't care for that argument. There's perhaps only two people of the nine that actually uh, listen to that style of argument anymore. And that's Justice Breyer and Justice Alito. But other than that, I'm sorry to tell you that, um, that they just don't care. Um, and that comes down to they just don't care how fancy you make your mousetrap. You can make a mousetrap uh, as fancy or as simple as you want it to be. Um, it's not the fault of the accused that you decide to involve uh, multiple people in the analysis, um, but uh, the, the point of view is that if you make a conscious decision, and because it is a conscious decision to have more than one person involved in testing, um, whether that's for efficiency, whether that's to control cognitive bias, whatever that might be, uh, there, it is still a conscious choice to involve more than one person uh, that's involved with it. Or it might be educational, that you purposely train these people only to do certain acts. And so, but the bottom line of it is, the Supreme Court flat out doesn't care and doesn't care in the slightest how you build your mousetrap. So from a point of view of trying to make that type of argument, um, you know, what's the old saying? The definition of insanity is to keep on doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And so if you're going to make a public policy argument, you might as well save it um, and take your limited amount of brief time or your limited amount of oral argument and go a different path because there's no support for that notion. There just isn't. And so it's better to dedicate resources towards a more viable style of argument. The other type of thing that um, doesn't work uh, well uh, in terms of trying to quote unquote get around the confrontation clause is to use a business record bootstrapped 703, 705 type of argument where you uh, say that the crime lab is generating business records. And so therefore that satisfies not only the state or the federal hearsay uh, exception, but more importantly, that the expert witness is allowed to rely upon the business record that's generated uh, 
uh, so to excuse the particular witness who generated the document from coming into court. The reason why that's a, a loser argument comes from this exchange that's here that comes from the Bullcoming versus New Mexico oral arguments. And so what we have here is we have a point where um, oral argument involved uh, Gary uh, King, uh, who was on behalf of the respondent, meaning the state of New Mexico, uh, and Scalia's exchange that's here that talks about how a business record um, can't be generated for the particular litigation. Um, and so let's listen to that. And so what, what happens with that is, you know, lots of time criminal defense attorneys don't acknowledge that there uh, is uh, application of the rules of evidence outside of criminal law. And there certainly is. There's a whole wealth of wonderful case law that's developed by our cousins, the, the uh, civil law practitioners. And it is, uh, for those of you who do civil law in addition to criminal law, you know very well that the business records exception to hearsay can't be from records that are generated in the course of particular litigation because that isn't uh, that doesn't qualify and certainly exactly what Justice Scalia says is right that you can't claim business records exception if it is used if it's for use during the particular prosecution so saying that a chromatogram of an unknown that's attributed to uh, a particular uh, defendant um, is a business record is a failing proposition even under the rules of evidence let alone confrontation and again remember the two are totally distinct from one another so under the understanding of how business records really work in the rules of evidence we can see that that's a failing or loser argument the next losing type of argument that I'd like to talk about is the notion and the reliance by the prosecution uh, that the result came from an accredited lab, and simply because the, the lab was accredited by some accrediting agency, that um, there should be some inherent reliability in the results. And what that really is, is and the reason why it's a loser argument, is a couple of different things, and we're going to hear a clip from Scalia that really encaps encapsulates um, why it's a losing argument. Uh, but the primary reason why it's a losing argument is because it's an appeal back to the Roberts criteria for sufficient reliability. If before Crawford we had the Roberts rule which was this uh, amorphous subjective idea of uh, whether or not something had sufficient reliability would determine its admissibility. And uh, the call for the change for that was because of uh, similarly situated people were treated totally differently even within the same courthouse or even with the same judge based upon what was there. So it was a call towards making more of bright line rules and giving greater guidance to the uh, courts as far as the primary purpose rule and that modern rubric that going back to that one sheet of paper with the decision tree that's there. The other reason is uh, because of what's encapsulated in this, uh, in this clip. So if you're a prosecutor and you're making this style of argument, I would suggest much like the idea of uh, that was presented earlier about the public policy that the innocent that the guilty will go free this is also a loser argument because right now we have several cases that stand in direct opposition to this um, by a super majority of the court by this point in time um, so there is no enjoyment of going back to this uh, pre Crawford Roberts type of idea that there is inherent reliability. And let's listen to this exchange. And it was analyzed at Selmark and came down. No, if they had incompetent people there. The last case we had involving this kind of an issue 
the, the reason they didn't bring in the lab technician to testify was that he had been fired in the interim for some reason which we didn't know but it, it was pretty clear why why he would not have been a very good witness we don't know how how good this lab was uh, we don't know how good the, the individuals who did the test were and that's why uh, uh, it, 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 it's up to the state to bring forward uh, the testimony saying what the lab did and the only testimony they brought forward was the testimony of this witness who was not there and that of course will be from the williams case that was recently uh, argued uh, on december 6th that's uh, pending a decision now and uh, so it's been repeatedly over and over again this idea of inherent reliability that it's an accredited lab is a failure type of argument so it's not something if I was a prosecutor that I would be putting forward because um, it's a it should be a clear loser now the next thing I want to do is talk to you about uh, the notion of uh, either that the uh, evidence the underlying evidence as they like to call it the raw data as they like to call it or really the data um, the, the, the underlying facts or the underlying information that gives rise to the conclusion was not admitted at all and so therefore uh, somehow or another that that doesn't affront confrontation and the idea or the notion that it's not admitted for the truth of the matter asserted and so therefore it should not affront confrontation or relevance it should not uh, and in any way shape or form uh, have a difficulty with relevance or the idea or the notion of that the witness is merely a scrivener for the machine generated data and why each and every one of those uh, is a failing argument for a lot of different reasons um, I'll start in reverse order the merely the a scrivener for the machine generated data uh, that is uh, what was argued directly in Bullcoming and that was a failure in Bullcoming um, and uh, and I would suggest that if uh, stare decisis were to rule the day then in the Williams case we will likewise have uh, an idea that a conduit even a fancy conduit um, or a surrogate witness even the most uh, beautiful surrogate witness isn't going to carry the day and overcome and trump the particular witness rule the idea that uh, the evidence that the uh, the expert relied upon which is really uh, you know the 703 705 type of argument uh, wasn't admitted at all and wasn't admitted for the truth of the matter asserted that's really the core issue or one of the core issues in the Williams case that was argued in December 6th and what it seems to me after reading and listening to the the transcripts and and also uh, really sitting down and thinking about the Williams case a lot it seems to me that there is a lot of people now again it's reading tea leaves and because the Super Bowl is upon us it's kind of like predicting the winner of the Super Bowl and the score that uh, that there is a, a tremendous amount of support for the notion the idea that the way that Williams occurred was uh, was devoid of any sort of true foundation meaning that the foundation wasn't set to attribute the um, to attribute the uh, the tested material back to the defendant or the victim what happened in the Williams case was that there was this uh, company by the name of Cellmark that the Illinois State Police outsourced uh, to do the DNA analysis uh, that was uh, attendant to an alleged rape and it was a commingled sample meaning that there was more than one contributor it was a vaginal swab to develop a profile and the loci with the alleles and the information as far as uh, that had to do with um, that allegation of rape and the genetic material that was left behind uh, and attributed not only uh, to a source meaning where it came from meaning the vaginal swab itself but also the generation of the electropharograms and the ultimate report that came to be now when it came to trial in Illinois no one from Selmark came to testify instead what they had is the state of Illinois employed their own uh, witness by the name of Labatos who took a look at the information that Selmark provided 
and the prosecution did not formally admit the cell mark information into trial. Nevertheless, Lombados, who is the state expert who was not from Cellmark, was permitted to testify to what amounts to the Cellmark information. And that's the basic factual understanding that's necessary to understand uh, the Cellmark and to understand the litigation that's going forward uh, with the Williams case. It seems to me, based upon reading the transcripts, listening to the oral arguments, and being as educated as I possibly can be on this particular case, that uh, Ginsburg, Scalia, Sotomayor, uh, Justice Kagan, and Alito all seem to think that the evidence should not have been admitted, meaning Lombatos' testimony, at all, because it, the foundation wasn't set, uh, meaning that it wasn't attributed to a particular source, meaning the vaginal swab in particular. And the other thing that um, is, is a remarkable part about the oral arguments in the Williams case, and a lot of uh, news organizations have uh, keyed in on it, is the exchange with uh, Justice Kennedy uh, and what he had to say, because you have to remember that Justice Kennedy was uh, in the dissent for a majority, if not all, of the Confrontation Clause cases, saying that confrontation, uh, the primary purpose rule, the, uh, the notion of going away from Roberts uh, was not in the direction that he wanted the development of uh, the constitutional concepts to go forward. So let's, talk, let's listen a little bit uh, to uh, Justice uh, Kennedy and what he had to say. The, 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 chain of, the chain of custody are just supporting actors. The key actor in the play, the Hamlet in the play, is the person who did the test at Selmark, and she or he is not here. And if you want to say, oh, this is not, tell the jury. Now, we're not saying that this is admitted for the truth. We're not saying that this is uh, William's DNA. The judge would say, well, then it's irrelevant. It's excluded. But the man and, and it seems to me, and, and, uh, just in response to Justice Scalia, uh, not, not, not only does uh, he indicate that this is hard to distinguish from Bill Coming, in Bill Coming, at least you had an expert say how the laboratory works. Here, you don't even have that. Well, you have less here. Ms. With reference to cell mark than you did in Volcom. Ms. Lombados did testify both on, on direct examination and cross examination that cell mark was an accredited lab. The Illinois State Police Crime Lab routinely uses uh, outs outsourced. But in Volcom, we said that was not sufficient, and in that case, the person was from that lab. But, but Ms. Lombados, ne we never introduced any cell mark reports in this case. There were no testimonial statements can conveyed through her testimony. There were no out-of-court statements used to prove the truth of the matter asserted. What was presented was the expert opinion of Ms. Lombados, who was a duly qualified expert in, 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 in forensic biology and DNA. And not only did she have the ability to look at the, the cell mark material. She interpreted the material that, that came from Selmark. And what came from Selmark, the electropherogram, what I, I would submit to you is not testimonial. It's a machine-generated uh, chart that to the naked eye, to, to a trier of fact, means absolutely nothing unless an expert actually interprets that. And Ms. Lombardo's testified to how she interpreted that. Um, she talks about the how that's in the any different from Bull Coming and Melinda's Diaz. So you can see that one of the people who disagreed with the holdings of uh, Bull Cumming and Melendez Diaz uh, seems to have struggled with this uh, particular factual scenario that's presented in Williams and suggests, at least, at the very least, that this is more offensive to confrontation in the modern jurisprudence than either one of those two cases. Um, and so if I was a prosecutor, then maybe again, uh, I wouldn't look to go and do these types of... Uh, arguments because, uh, again, uh, stare decisis uh, and the principles that are there, uh, this, this would be, again, a loser type of argument. Um, so another one that that's, uh, I would suggest is a loser type of argument comes from uh, the notion that the expert did their own independent review, keyword independent. And so what I'd like to do is look at the exchange between uh, Justices uh, Sotomayor and Justices Ginsburg with Anita Alvarez, who was the state's attorney um, from the state of Illinois, who argued in the Williams case, to give you an idea of kind of how this argument 
of independent review kind of falls flat on its face if you were to think about it. And uh, Anita Alvarez is a very skilled practitioner, did an admirable job arguing her position with the state, so I don't mean to pick on her whatsoever. Um, but I think that this is instructive for us to understand um, the notions that are being presented as to whether or not it's the expert's own independent review and somehow that excuses it from the rubric of modern day confrontation clause jurisprudence. So let's listen. Manifest. So what's that, the difference between this and Justice Kennedy's question about Bull Cumming? Could the expert in Bull Cumming have said, as one of the amici here said, that all they would have had to do in Bull Cumming is to read or to give a report that gave the blood alcohol content the point five or point ten or whatever it was, and have an expert come in and say that number shows he's drunk. Well, is that any different than this situation? If the expert in bull coming did more than what he simply did in bull coming, and that was just simply read the report and and testify that that's what that lab did, if he actually did his own independent analysis based on his expertise, based on... No, no, the only part of his expertise is the report says 0.10. I'm not offering it for the truth. I'm assuming if that's true, then he was legally drunk. If he were, if he were to give his independent opinion based on his analysis and what he had done, then we would have seen as he was close, closer... He, all the report do, did was give a number. And the supervisor comes in and says that number violates his legal drunkenness. Well, if How is that different? If that, if that report is being used, is being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. All right, but you're not telling me why that's not the same here, because he, what this expert said is the cell mark report is from this victim. So it's the same set of numbers as in bull coming. Now he's taking a set and saying, instead of legal drug, drunkness, it matches someone else's that I took. But now what happened here was Ms. Lombados testified uh, based, and gave her own independent expert opinion based on her skills, her knowledge, her expertise. You, you said she was lying dependent, and I don't understand, you said that in your brief. I don't understand how uh, Lombados' testimony can be independent of the test results supplied. I mean, it's based on the, the, the test results. She, she, she can't be independent of, of them because it's entirely dependent on them. And so what we can see there is that it's true, which is these aren't independent reviews. These are totally dependent upon the information that they're given. It isn't as if they're doing an independent analysis that stood alone uh, from the raw materials and therefore was going there because clearly if there had been a retest for example of you get the information from Cellmark it comes out and it says what it says and it's attributable to a source then what the state of Illinois could have done is got the samples back could have retested it on their own and that would have been a totally independent uh, analysis and totally independent review but instead they elected not to do so and to claim that it's an independent review or an independent analysis falls flat on its face to anyone who sits and really thinks about what is there because it's totally dependent upon the information that is generated by someone else. So let's take a look at what Justice Scalia said later on in the same argument uh, in terms of this type of assertion that is frequently made by uh, prosecutors today. In addition, well, but you did just say I relied on stuff that I received from uh, from Caremark, whatever the, the the name of the lab was. Oh. She said I re I relied on material that was a swab containing the DNA, uh, the, the 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 sperm of this particular individual, and she did not know that. She testified that she relied on those materials, and she can't. She didn't just say I got something back from the lab. And I relied on whatever that said. No, she, she said what she had gotten back from the lab. And she did not know of her personal knowledge that it was what she said it was. And so 
trying to make that claim that it's an independent review, I would suggest is a losing argument as well. Also a losing argument as well is claiming that everything that is generated is merely goes to the chain of custody or the maintenance records. As we all know, if you've been familiar with the development of this jurisprudence, in the case of uh, Melendez-Diaz, uh, there's a footnote uh, in there that talks about that uh, not everything that is done uh, in terms of chain of custody or maintenance records uh, is a violation of a confrontation clause. And what happens uh, with that is, I would suggest, is over-interpreted or over-expanded beyond its natural context and is divorced of the further holdings of cases like Bryant and also uh, Bullcoming. For example, what is frequently argued has to do with chain of custody. The one thing that the confrontation clause doesn't do is require the government to, uh, to produce any evidence. Uh, but what it says is if you choose to produce evidence, that you must prove it up in a manner that does not affront confrontation. And what that really means is quite simply this. There is no requirement from a federal jurisprudence point of view that chain of custody be presented. Chain of custody, as it's frequently talked about, goes to the weight of the evidence, not towards the admissibility of the evidence. And that much is true. If the prosecution chooses not to bring in chain of custody evidence, then it will never violate the Confrontation Clause because it's not been introduced by the government. However, if they choose to bring in chain of custody related evidence, for example, what that typically is, is that I received this specimen from so-and-so. When I received it, it was intact. That I handled it in a particular way so as to make sure that it is not to be uh, transformed, contaminated, or otherwise changed in its transportation that I did over to the next point along that chain of custody. If the government wants to bring in those type of statements, then that would make it testimonial by its very nature, because those are testimonial assertions. Now, having said that, that also comes into the idea of the primary purpose. If the criminal prosecution never existed in that example that I gave, then we wouldn't have those statements. The way to get around it, quite frankly, is reliance upon third-party vendors who have a primary purpose outside of the instant litigation. For example, reliance upon FedEx or a commercial vendor, UPS, to transmit the samples. And if they have bills of lading, if they have uh, transportation logs that are kept in the routine order of business for the primary purpose of their commercial enterprise, which is larger and greater than their uh, criminal prosecution, which is a small subset and indeed a very small percentage of what's out there, then it doesn't confront confrontation because of the fact that the primary purpose of those records is not for litigation. So they could be introduced under those circumstances. But in the case where a retired detective, whose whole job is to take evidence from point A to the crime lab at point B and generate documents along the way, then we fall back to our analysis of the business records exception and how that's not, uh, how it's not to be considered. And then also on top of that, the confrontation related issue that that would indeed be a testimonial statement. Another one that is frequently mistaken for is in the fact of uh, calibration records. For example, in the, uh, in the typical modern jurisdictions that uh, use evidential breath testing or BRAC results as a means of prosecuting someone for a uh, violation of a per se based uh, DUI or DWI or OVI uh, prosecution and where they have to prove that magic number, the blood alcohol content or the breath alcohol content, depending upon your statute. That it's frequently argued by prosecutors 
that the certificates of accuracy and calibration, which are really verification checks, that are a procedural prerequisite for introduction of the main actor, the hamlet, if you will, the blood alcohol content, are merely maintenance records or business records exceptions. Uh, I would suggest that that uh, type of argument should fail under the modern rubric because the government is seeking to introduce it because they want to get into evidence the, the breath alcohol concentration. And because they're seeking to introduce it, they, they can't do it just by way of affidavit, because that would be no different than the Melendez-Diaz case. And they can't rely upon business records because of what we talked about uh, before in traditional classic notions that are there. The sole purpose uh, for these types of uh, reports is for prosecution, the admiss admissibility of the evidence. It's not for routine maintenance, and the reason why it's not for routine maintenance is because there's no ulterior purpose behind them. It's not as if I could, me and my friends could go out and get drunk and come to the police station and say, we're really drunk, we'd like to blow into your gizmo, here's $50. And so not only isn't there a business record exception because they're not in a traditional sense in the business of something, but also on top of that, they're not maintained for the maintenance other than for prosecuting people because it's not open to the public. This is to be contrasted with, again, our hospital blood example. For example, uh, in most states, or I would say a majority of states, when it comes to blood test results for blood alcohol content, it's not required that you show that it's on a calibrated device and that there's specificity and some sort of specificity test like a volatile mix or any sort of quality control that needs to be introduced in order for the admissibility of the evidence. In that particular type of case, the prosecution could mention none of that, just enter the result into evidence by the particular witness and walk away without any violation of the confrontation clause. But the reason why they can do that is because the hospital analyzer, which is typically an enzymatic assay, is maintained in the calibration or the maintenance related records are generated for the greater global purpose, its primary purpose, of diagnostic treatment of people in the emergency room or in the hospital. And so in that particular case, it would not be offensive to the confrontation clause. So context is everything. But claiming everything is merely the chain of custody or maintenance records and relying upon that footnote, Melendez-Diaz, should be very dangerous for a prosecutor because of, uh, if you can articulate how it's not, then you have, uh, then you then there is indeed a confrontation clause, a relevancy uh, type of, uh, you know, uh, evidentiary based objection that, that's certainly there. Now, one of the other losing arguments, so you don't think I'm just picking on uh, prosecutors, um, is the notion of that you can't ring your own bell and complain about the noise. And if you remember, there's that child song that goes like this. And I have a three-year-old, so you know these things become particularly relevant to me. And if you remember this song from your own childhood, or else if you have a child or a grandchild, uh, you'll, of course, remember how this song goes. It goes like this. There's a hole in my bucket, dear Liza, dear Liza. There's a hole in my bucket, dear Liza, a hole. Dear Henry, mend it. And then what happens is it becomes this, and there's many, many different verses of it. And the solutions that are presented there can't be possible at the end where there is no way to fix the hole in the bucket. Um, and the bucket remains leaky and uh, defeats its purpose, um, which is to deliver water. Kind of like the snake eating its own tail. Uh, when does it ever end? You know, it's, it's feast. And so the notion that, a, uh, that the criminal defense attorney can create a confrontation clause environment or complain about it is, uh, is not a good argument to make. You can't ring your own bell and complain about the noise. So, for example, uh, in a context where uh, a calibration curve or quality control is necessary uh, for a device, say a gas chromatogram that's doing a chromatograph, rather, that's doing flame ionization detectors. We all know that quantitation is based upon constructing a calibration curve. Uh, 
Unfortunately, in the United States, uh, calibration curves are generated on a day different than the testing of the unknowns, and a historical calibration curve is, uh, it seems to be the norm, as opposed to uh, within-run uh, calibrators being used uh, within the run. And so what you have is a potential there for the calibration efforts and the proof of specificity through a volatile mix or resolution standard or something like that is on a different day, maybe by a different analyst, than the testing of the unknowns. So you have a two-witness uh, person who is part of this process. The prosecution decides to call in the, uh, the witness who did the testing of the unknown, meaning that they did the sample preparation, uh, they added the internal standard, and then they put the blanks and they did the actual uh, positioning and, uh, and put it into the machine and did the testing. The chromatograms resulted. It was interpreted uh, by the integration parameters that are there. Uh, and the quantification of a particular analyte is espoused by this particular analyst. That person comes into court. The prosecution says, tell us what the result is. The person says it's a 0.15 BAC. But the person does not mention that I know that it's a good measurement, meaning a 0.15 ethanol result, to the exclusion of everything else because I ran a volatile mix and it showed good resolution or separation and that I know that the quantification, the, the quantitative measurement, is also a good one and valid because there was a calibration event that occurred um, and that it was shown to be within acceptable tolerances uh, and it created a uh, calibration curve with an R squared by way of regression analysis that resulted in three or four nines. Um, and so if they didn't say that part and they just instead said a 0.15 BAC, then arguably there would be no confrontation clause related issue in and of itself. Now, um, the, for example, in our example where they just come in and say it's a 0.15 BAC and leave it at that, on cross-examination, a smart criminal defense attorney would say uh, something along the lines of getting them to admit that a 0.15 BAC is dependent upon their specificity which means their proof of resolution, their volatile mix that they put in there to prove the separation, and dependent upon the quality control and the traceability of those standards that come into the calibration curve that's the ultimate result. Now by doing that, you as a criminal defense attorney have opened up that can of worms and gotten to this hole in the bucket thing. And the reason why the argument should fail, I would suggest, is because the government isn't introducing the calibration uh, efforts isn't introducing the quality control with the blanks and the standards but instead you are and so because of that it, it uh, you can't ring your own bell and complain about the noise because if you couldn't you were able to do that strictly based upon confrontation clause then it's a never-ending cycle downwards towards getting uh, witnesses into infinity into the courtroom because if you think about it uh, then it would require uh, one step removed away from our uh, person who does the quality control and that would be the next person along the chain which would be for example the person who installed the instrument and did its uh, suitability checks and the person who um, made the electrical Romex wires in the building itself that made the socket or the receptacle that the machine got plugged into or you know ultimately the the conductor of the of the train that transported the coal to the uh, person who uh, put it into the coal burning furnace that generated the electricity and then ultimately back to the coal miner who um, developed the the stream of coal and brought it to market through all of these things so it becomes this hole in the bucket type of thing logically if you were to think about it and so defense attorneys should be particularly aware that um, of getting their argument framed in this way either by way of their own devices or by way of their uh, of their uh, friend on the other side uh, trying to characterize their argument as this hole in the bucket type of uh, rationale of confrontation clause and I would suggest that that's just wrong um, and uh, it should not win. And the reason why I think it should not win 
is based upon not only just common sense, but also this exchange that happened most recently in the Williams case with Justice Sotomayor. But in fact, that's what she did. If you read her testimony, I give you an example at page 79. She tells on cross-examination exactly what the steps were in the Selmark report, what numbers they gave, and she tells and explains. She take, uh, The state's attorney took pride in this. She said, I disagree with that number that they came up with. I think the number should be. So she's really reading the report. Well, first of all, Justice Sotomayor, that did come in on cross-examination, and I don't think that Petitioner is contending that's evidence that he himself elicits on cross-examination. Right. So then let's not, the all right, so let's, so let's get to, can I focus on... And so what we have there is uh, that uh, Deputy uh, Solicitor General Drebin, who uh, was the government's um, presentation, at the invitation of the Supreme Court uh, in the Williams case talking about and deflating and basically presenting that which I talked about right here which is you know you can't ring your own bell and complain about the noise because uh, it is a very um, prickly pear if you will as far as this hole in the bucket type of situation so don't allow don't present that argument if you're a defense attorney and don't allow the prosecution uh, to present it in that light either um, and if you're a prosecutor, you do well to try and frame uh, the defendant's uh, counsel's argument as this hole in the bucket type of uh, mentality. Um, so I, I want to bring about something that hasn't really been discussed tremendously, but it's a thought that I had uh, with respect to uh, the next evolution, if you will, of this development of the case law. And, uh, and it was through one of my colleagues here at, at this firm, Tim Baruch, that gave me the original inspiration um, to think about it some more. You know, he was thinking about this from a discovery point of view, and I, of course, with my own bias in place and loving this uh, confrontation clause uh, discussion, um, thought it from a different point of view. So what I suggest would be a good way for criminal law practitioners to get around this hole in the bucket type of analogy is to not frame it in the sense of the confrontation clause, but instead to take a look at another uh, rule-based um, rule of evidence uh, to um, in the context of forensic science. And if anyone remembers this movie, it's a great movie. Thank you. If you remember this movie, this is Jerry Maguire, of course, where he says, you complete me. And it comes down to uh, rules of evidence. Um, and one of the rules of evidence is commonly referred to as the rule of completeness. And this is what the rule typically says, and this is the federal rule. And if you read it here, I'll, I will uh, absolutely, totally uh, apologize for uh, insulting your intelligence by reading it out loud because you can read a lot faster than I can speak, but it bears the emphasis. If a party introduces our all or part of a writing or a keyword recorded statement, an adverse party may require the introduction at that time of any other part or any other or any other writing or recorded statement that in fairness ought to be considered at the same time. Now there's the traditional thoughts, and that's to be contrasted with the new approach that I'm suggesting. And the traditional thoughts, uh, this is, I got in a very great uh, discussion with Professor uh, Jules Epstein over at Widener uh, one day about this. And the way that he suggested and the way that he teaches evidence uh, with respect to the rule of completeness is in its traditional notion which is something like this. Imagine, and this is his example, so I thank him for allowing me to, to use it. In a traditional thought, Rule 106 of the Rule of Completeness would be something akin to this. Imagine that the New York Times movie reviewer went and watched a movie and wrote in its newspaper, nothing about this movie is great. So that's the actual complete statement. 
but the producers of the movie decided to excise only part of it and produce uh, a poster that said this movie is great and attribute it to that, uh, that movie reviewer. The movie reviewer gets upset, they go to trial, and at trial the, uh, the, the producers try and say, well he said this movie is great, but at the time that it's introduced, this recorded statement, in fairness, the entire statement needs to be produced, which is nothing about this movie is great. That's the traditional thoughts of the rule of completeness. Well, as we know with forensic science and the new approach that I'm advocating or suggesting that needs to be examined is the traditional idea that the defendant's BAC was 0.15. That is a snippet of information because what really underlies it is all of the, to get to that ultimate place and that ultimate point of view that presuming that it's a valid um, expression of the opinion that it seems to be a conclusion which is the defendant's BAC was a 0.15. What that really is made up of in, and the underlying facts would be that it's a validated method on a stable instrument on a well-trained operator using acceptable QC that it was met or exceeded an adequate QA or quality assurance or the double check. I don't know how Certainly, defendant's BAC was a 0.15 is a recorded statement. I don't know how it isn't a recorded statement. At the time it's introduced, in fairness, what ought to be considered is all of the underlying stuff. So where you don't get to this point of this movie is great instead of the truth, which is nothing about this movie is great. Because just saying in and of itself the defendant's BAC was 0 0.15 without giving the full story which is maybe it isn't a part of a validated method, a truly validated method that uses the Huber approach and the USP approach of how to, how to validate the method. Maybe it isn't a stable instrument. Maybe it isn't a well-trained operator. Maybe the QC hasn't been met or hasn't been rigorous enough. Uh, maybe there is no adequate QA, for example, that the person who's evaluating the data that's produced is not qualified uh, to run the assay itself. So, you know, the bottom line of it is that um, we should really consider the rule of completeness, 106, in that Venn diagram to add a fourth level that we have to deal with. So it's not just hearsay-based evidentiary rules, that it's not just also confrontation clause, and also not just issues of 403 and personal knowledge, but also the rule of completeness. And I would suggest that if you understand the science and you're a criminal defense attorney, you should be considering the role of completeness and see whether or not you can get the entire statement introduced. So that way, in fairness, it can be considered at the same time. Now, we, one of the questions that came up before about in the instant litigation, meaning the Williams case, um, was uh, this notion of why um, the, uh, the underlying uh, statements or the underlying report from Selmark wasn't introduced or offered for the truth of the matter asserted. And then more particularly, there's a curiosity as to why uh, the state of Illinois in an important case involving a serial rapist, which Mr. Williams was ultimately convicted of, uh, being a serial rapist, didn't fly in the analysts from Selmark um, like to address those couple of things. The first thing is because if they had introduced the report from Selmark um, that goes towards this case uh, and introduced it into evidence, and this is actually what it looks like, the LJ is just the, uh, is the uh, redaction of uh, information, identifying information as far as the, um, the person who uh, was the alleged victim. And so what you can see from here is that there is a lot of statements that are made, testimonial statements I would suggest, that were made in this conclusory report that's there. It's not just machine-generated data and uh, that's uh, being produced.
So uh, in the history of the Williams case, as we know, um, originally the prosecution had, um, had uh, not introduced it, so it wasn't part of the record. And then there was a motion to lodge the Cellmark report and its underlying data that Lombados relied upon in her evaluation. Uh, and that was opposed by the state of Illinois uh, and eventually the uh, United States Supreme Court justices wanted to see it. And I think this is instructive because it shows that it is a lot more than quote-unquote machine-generated data that Lombados had in determining uh, the outcome that was there in the ultimate opinion that was expressed by Lombados. So the question becomes, you know, with a very important case involving a serial rapist, why wasn't the particular person who in the Selmark case would have been one or two people uh, brought into court to testify and therefore get rid of this confrontation clause related issue? And it had nothing to do with money, I would suggest. It would have everything to do with uh, the the situation that Selmark found itself in. Now, this is all public record and public information that I'm relying upon um, that's out there, so it's not libelous or slanderous. Uh, and so maybe part of the reason why it wasn't brought in, and again, this is the report itself, so you can see the types of information that Lombados uh, had in her hands and the statements that were here, and particularly the attribution to a particular source. And that's where a lot of the focus of this case should be. But when we take a look at why the cell mark people weren't called, I would suggest that uh, maybe uh, criminal defense attorneys involved in this case were prepared with bringing forth information that would tarnish the reliability, the veracity, the validity of the result that was generated by Cellmark itself. Because the Baltimore uh, Sun uh, did an exposition about um, the Cellmark itself. And as we can see here, as part of what was there, um, that the uh, there was some data manipulation uh, that happened by the folks at the laboratory the folk, I should say, the one person at the laboratory. I would hope that the person was fired, but the bottom line of it is it shows an issue, uh, not just with that particular analyst who manipulated the, uh, the data itself, uh, but also showed an issue and a failure of the quality assurance program that's in place. Because as you know, it's in a well-run laboratory. It shouldn't just be an analyst on an island by themselves doing their analysis and reporting it out. There must be some sort of quality assurance or double check, if you will. And this shows that in at least 20 different cases, there was a, um, there was a, a definite issue with their quality assurance program. And so maybe that was something that would have been brought out on cross-examination. We also have reported literature in which Cellmark was talked about. And this talks about, again, a failure of a quality assurance program where in 1995 Cellmark Diagnostics admitted that a similar sample switch error had caused it to report incorrectly that a rape defendant's DNA profile matched DNA found in a vaginal aspirate from the rape victim. Now the reason why that's significant is basically because of a translational issue where they marked a known as an unknown, they got a perfect match and what ended up happening in this DNA case was that the defendant was excluded as a potential donor uh, when it was all talked about. Granted, this is back in 1995, but still it shows a failure of the quality assurance program. And I would suggest that would be relevant information to bring forward to the trier of fact to show um, the, the validity or the reliability of Selmark's work might be in question. Furthermore, we have the a particular particular peculiar case, and this is the Kovac case, and this is from the transcript that's there. And I'll allow you to read the relevant part uh, involving Michael Carpenter, who at that time was a deputy district attorney. He did the honorable and the right thing uh, before the court and during this um, particular hearing and this trial that was there. Mr. Carpenter reported a major mistake that had been made. 
the vaginal swab in that particular case apparently had DNA from only the victim. However, Cellmark switched labels on the known samples from the victim and the suspect and thus declared the match between suspect and the DNA from the sperm fraction of the vaginal swab as being identical. Charlotte Word at Cellmark catches this error while testifying in court. And Selmark's spin on this was that ultimately they caught the mistake. And two, the DNA technology worked okay. There was a transcription-related error, just like the other reported case. And does this mean that the court testimony is now considered a regular part of Selmark's review process? And that's a good question. And what if there had been a plea bargain before the Selmark employee was discovered and was asked to testify and found the mistake that was there? And that really shows a massive failure of a quality assurance program that but for this person pressing it to trial would not have been discovered. So at the end, the report that it erroneously attributed a person as a match to some evidence of DNA and does so much damage because of this culture that we have of the infallibility of DNA that maybe this would have been brought up at trial because it absolutely would cast again the reliability and the validity of the work that is done uh, at Cellmark in a different light than just a simple conclusion. Now with the Williams case itself and its particular facts and circumstances I would suggest that the prosecution is, is in a very difficult position. I know that Justice Breyer because he's written opinions and dissents, has been very vocal, is often thought to be the person on the polar opposite side of perhaps Ginsburg and, uh, and Scalia on confrontation. But the truth of the matter is, in my humble opinion, Alito is, um, because Alito is amenable to the sky is falling type of argument and has, uh, and has been on the dissenting side and prefers, it seems, the Roberts rationale of sufficient reliability uh, because he is uh, concerned with the practicalities of the holdings of the court. The reason why that I point this particular exchange out is because it seems, based upon these uh, statements, that even Justice Alito, again relying upon stare decisis, sees that a testimonial statement was made in the Selmark case. So let's take a look at this. Of what was done at Selmark, and she did make a statement. Uh, she did say that the sample, that the, the result that came back from Selmark was, it was done, was based on a test of the vaginal swab that was sent there. The other, it has to do with what Selmark did, how well they did it. She didn't say anything about that. Now, as and so, in, it seems from that comment that he believes that a testimonial statement was made that attributed the information produced to a source by Lombados. And so Lombados was acting as a mere conduit or a surrogate witness under the facts presented in this particular case. So one of the things that um, I like to do um, is not just admire a problem, uh, because it's, you know, what's the value of admiring a problem? For example, everyone knows and can identify that long-term and even short-term stability in the Middle East is a problem. Um, but no one can offer a consensus-based solution of how to fix this big problem. So it does very little good uh, to identify uh, and admire a problem. It does a world of good to try and present a solution. So I'm going to be very, 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 very practical here in my proposed solutions. And the first one is don't think of it as a problem. Um, a lot of people particularly those who are from the prosecution side of these matters, or maybe even from the labs themselves, see this as a confrontation clause problem. And that's the wrong way of taking a look at it. Um, you have to take a look at it as a reality. You know, you can, you can worry about things that you uh, can't change, and it will do you no good. For example, I'm five foot five, I'm 203 pounds. I will never dunk a basketball. And I can sit here and have my whole life and go around and sit there and, and complain about how I can't dunk a basketball on a regulation size hoop and net. 
or number two is that I can move on. And what I suggest doing is, is that to a degree, we need to move on. And we need to embrace and accept this for what it is, which is not a problem, but a right. A right that a prosecutor or a person in the crime lab would absolutely enjoy if they were accused of a crime. That allowing a piece of paper to form the basis of guilt, just like happened with Sir Walter Raleigh, it was unacceptable in 1603. It should be equally unacceptable in this year, 2012. So I would suggest that we stop looking at it as a problem. But in as much as it is a problem, I'll play along with that game. And the reality of the situation is that don't worry about it from a prosecution point of view. There will be some massively underinformed uh, pro-prosecution judges or even pro-defense judges that will not understand this at all. They don't care to be educated on it. They've been living their whole life under the Rob Roberts rule of sufficient reliability. So getting them to change their way of doing things is not what judiciaries are known for. Um, so from a point of view, the old adage, the rules of the number one rule of evidence that doesn't appear in any evidence book absolutely applies and is still in effect even after all of these cases. And the number one rule of evidence that's not written and is still in effect is if the prosecution wants it to get in, it will get in. If the defense wants it to get in, it probably won't get in. So from a point of view of worrying about the sky is falling, I'm going to tell you, based upon my own experience, and then also based upon the experience of a lot of different colleagues, that uh, courts and judges will do all sorts of mental gymnastics in order to differentiate and make distinguishable the Supreme Court of uh, the United States. So much so that Tim Baruch of this office had a judge who literally said on the record after Melendez-Diaz came out that he wasn't sure if Pennsylvania had adopted the rule of Melendez-Diaz. When the truth of the matter is, you have no choice. It's the Supreme Court of the United States. So it isn't optional. But a lot of judges, again, are, uh, they do a very hard job, a very difficult job, how you have to be a master of all sorts of law in these courts of general jurisdiction is got to be difficult. That's why I don't want to be a judge, uh, because I don't want to be, uh, don't want to divide my attention. But the bottom line of it is that you don't have to worry about it if you're a prosecutor, because uh, the old-fashioned system will continue to be. If I knew of a way to educate uh, judges on the law or facts or science, I'd retire and make a book and probably sell it to you all. But the bottom line of it is that uh, the status quo will generally not be interrupted. Furthermore, intermediate appellate courts, especially elected ones, will always look to be practical over principled. And that's why when we take a look at the interpretation of what follows after Melendez-Diaz, I suggest that there are a lot of published opinions that are out there, and even after bull coming, that there are start, there's starting to be a developed case law on the state level interpreting these things. And what intermediate courts are doing is they're distinguishing when, in fact, if you take a look at it, it's truly indistinguishable, or their rationale for distinguishing isn't, isn't apt. So you really don't have to worry about the appellate courts necessarily overturning the trial courts practical as applied notions. Um, and then state supreme courts are courts of uh, discretionary review, except for in the case of maybe capital cases. So the chances of them being reviewed on the state supreme court level are very slim. And then the United States Supreme Court is absolutely a court of discretion. So the chances of getting it overturned upon appeal for a confrontation clause related issue is uh, the exception, certainly not the rule. So the next thing uh, from a business perspective for businesses that are employed um, outside of the crime laboratory who in, have a very fancy type of mousetrap, you should consider revamping your process to make it less, uh, less people involved with it or in some way uh, making it so we, uh, the, the laboratory doesn't shut down if you're a smaller laboratory. Um, if these people are required to come into court. Uh, 
So you revamp your business model just like all businesses do or you redesign your process. Maybe you automate more things where you go out and you invest in the, uh, in the various sample preparation devices that are available on the market so as to get rid of the human factors that are involved in, in this process, that the preparation uh, process that's there, the sample treatment process or the preparative chromatography that's necessary. Maybe that's something to consider. All businesses have to change to the corporate or the uh, world realities. Uh, I don't know why forensic labs are any different. State crime labs, again, if you, uh, if you have a complicated process or procedure, you have two choices, really. Number one is continue doing what you're doing and, uh, and, and see whether or not it affects you. Or number two is redesign your process. You know, the other solution that's been bantered about and thought about is modern technology and I call this the Skype solution. Where Skype is free, you can Skype someone in or you can do it by way of more fancy uh, ISDN lines um, from various things. And of course in Pennsylvania and other states we have um, some uh, developed case law that makes such a solution uh, not good. But the bottom line of it is that um, the question becomes whether or not Skype and we can have the uh, lab analysts testify from within the confines of their laboratory, therefore alleviating the need for them to come in, wait around for them to be called, and then that way they can do more sample throughput. Number one, you've got to remember that uh, it seems from the United States Supreme Court point of view that the Supreme Court just doesn't care about the practical uh, realities of a crime laboratory in particular and whether or not there's so much time that's wasted traveling from a centralized lab type of thing and waiting around in court for them to be called or not called or for the case to go away and therefore they lose a day of work. It just seems to not be a notion in care. And when, if you remember in the very beginning of this we had in the presence of the accused in quotes and what we look at is the Skype solution being why I put it in quotes and so listen to this exchange that happened uh, in the Williams case. I'm sorry, in the Bullcoming case. And this was when Jeff Fisher, who represented uh, the petitioner, who was Donald Bullcoming, was uh, discussing um, the, uh, the, the particular witness rule, which eventually came to be, and the, uh, and the discussion with, uh, with Justice Ginsburg. Say in the presence, do you, do you mean it necessarily must be in the courtroom or would it be a video conferencing setup be permissible so that the technician or the, the analyst could testify from the lab rather than it would be screened in the, in the courthouse? Well, the default rule in the confrontation clause is in presence in the courtroom. Now, in Maryland against Craig, this court held in a child witness setting, of course, very different than this case, that closed circuit TV would be permissible. Uh, and I believe, you know, in a future case, if, a, if the state perhaps made some sort of showing the lab analyst uh, couldn't come to court for some reason, and certainly if the defendant stipulated, maybe even if the defendant didn't stipulate, well, the, the court could accommodate. Consent, so we don't, that's not a concern, but, but, um, let's suppose the defendant doesn't stipulate. Is this adequate to meet the confrontation clause? I don't think it would be adequate, Justice Ginsburg, with at least some, absent at least some showing of unavailability of the witness or in, of making the witness unable to come to court. Now, now, there is an amicus brief in the case, I believe, that suggests some flexibility that trial judges might employ in, in, in accommodating lab analyst schedules. What about um, these witnesses? What about uh, uh, not requiring uh, the officer who... Uh, who uh, took the confession or, or who witnessed uh, the alleged crime, uh, uh, not requiring him to appear because he's busy. Well, that's never been... The... He's out on the beat, so uh, can, can we have him appear by television? That's never been the rule, Justice Scalia, and I don't think there would be... Why, is, any... a lab, why is a lab technician different? I, I, don't think, I don't think one is, and you don't have to reach that in this case because the state never attempted to make any showing that Mr. Taylor was unavailable for any reason. And so, if you take a look at this, there is no parenthetical thought in the Constitution, certainly, because uh, with respect to forensic science, because they didn't have a notion of it back when the framers uh, adopted it. But the, the 
the problem, or the amendments, really, the, the, the problem here is modern day life and, and how we deal with these things. So if, if we don't allow a police officer to introduce uh, statements from another person and that other person is not in court, then, you know, you always take a look at it, not from the forensic science exception to the Constitution, but rather, if a police officer were to do a similar type of thing, would it be an affront to the Confrontation Clause? And that's what Justice Scalia is getting to, is, uh, I would suggest, is that there should not be, and there is not, a forensic science exception to the Constitution. So, what it really comes down to is this idea of the, the intersection of risk and reward by the prosecution. Again, we go back to the original thought, which is no, no one is requiring the government to do anything. No one is requiring the government to use forensic science. No one is requiring the government to uh, introduce any particular type of evidence. But if they choose to, then they have to balance this risk versus reward type of situation on how they are going to present it. In the example that we gave before with the gas chromatograph, uh, with flame ionization detector, if you wanted to present just the particular witness who generated the chromatogram into court and not mention the calibration that was done by another or the other quality control that was done by another on another day, then you run a, a definite risk as a prosecutor with a sophisticated criminal defense attorney who would potentially argue we don't know how good these results are because we've heard no evidence whatsoever as to the quality control and procedures that were in place or its ability to discriminate and conclude that it's ethanol to the exclusion of everything else on the planet Earth and therefore be a valid qualitative measurement and a valid quantitative measurement. And so they run that risk versus the reward. And so that's a daily type. And, and just because it's forensic science doesn't make that, that risk-reward situation any better or any worse. It's been going on for as long as there have been criminal trials. If there are 20 people who saw a murder occur, a, a smart prosecutor isn't going to introduce all 20 of them uh, because there are going to be inconsistencies among them. They might choose their top one or two but they certainly would run a tremendous risk of presenting all 20. The same thing is true with respect to, uh, you know, how you prove up other extrinsic evidence to the case. You know, uh, is it important to bring in the ATM machine video in combination with the eyewitness, in combination with the receipt from the ATM, or do you just go with the eyewitness? And so, you know, this idea of risk versus reward isn't unique to these modern forensic times in these cases. It's just, it's just unique because it's the first time it's been really rigorously discussed. So you don't have to bring in all information. You can run the risk as, the, uh, as a prosecutor does in every other case that uh, the challenges to the weight of the evidence uh, would win the day, so to speak, uh, for the defendant or run the risk, better put, that the weight of evidence is insufficient to prove the prosecution's burden of production and persuasion and overcome the presumption of innocence. Another practical solution is the do-over button. You know, keep samples until the case is fully litigated through at least trial. Now, that's not a perfect solution. And the reason why it's not a perfect solution is because samples degrade over time, particularly biological samples. For example, marijuana dries out so the mass measurement would change unless it was in a humidity controlled environment, even then some. And of course, volatile organic compounds uh, will evaporate, you know, so things like ethanol in the blood will eventually uh, go down. So they might even vaporize. Uh, but, you know, whether or not that goes below a critical measurement and at what rate, who knows. But the bottom line of it is that sometimes the do-over isn't a practical a situation or in the case of totally destructive sampling that is done um, that you know you might exhaust all of the sample so do-over might not be possible so maybe that's not a real solution but in the case where it is then it makes sense to do over and uh, 
make the particular witness available um, and plan ahead and know whether or not your witness retired, know whether or not the person was fired, indicted, uh, retired, deployed, or deceased. Those are things that traditionally uh, you would hope that a prosecutor would do, but in the realities of the situation and the massive amount of throughput that a typical and caseload that a typical prosecutor runs into, these things may not be known. So what it comes down to, I think the ultimate solution, like it or not, um, from a laboratory perspective and point of view, is, uh, is to uh, videotape. Uh, videotape the analysis. Videotape uh, the key parts of the analysis. Maybe you don't have to videotape the whole thing, but videotaping the key parts of the analysis um, would be helpful in the case of, uh, of one of those uh, unfortunate events where someone's either fired, indicted, retired, deployed, or uh, deceased. Um, and, you know, it, it's, a, it's an amazing amount of resistance that's put up when I talk about this with scientists who work in a crime lab that they would possibly be uh, videotaped while they do their analysis. And I understand it from a personal point of view that, uh, you know, in America we, we treasure our freedoms and we don't like Big Brother. But uh, in this modern day and age where everyone that I know of, except for maybe my three-year-old, has a cell phone and almost every single cell phone has some sort of video capability, and there really isn't an excuse. Data is cheap. Um, you can set up uh, motion-activated, uh, you know, um, cameras that dump into uh, hard drives and that would be able to be uh, kept and cataloged in perpetuity and data is extremely cheap um, that's out there so there's really not much of an excuse other than the old-fashioned that I don't like people to watch what I'm doing and uh, that comes down to I can, I can appreciate that from a defense attorney and a civil libertarian point of view that um, Big Brother shouldn't be involved in our lives, but I think that there are certain trade-offs that you do when you when you come into the forensic arena that that maybe not exist in uh, in a non-forensic arena. Uh, that there's a certain level of scrutiny, as I suggest that there should be uh, in these types of cases. You know, a lot is being made about uh, some of the cases that are percolating through the system, and what I suggest is probably the best test of the. Uh, outside edge of the confrontation clause and that's in the case of autopsy related cases where the assailant or the perpetrator um, is not immediately apparent. You know there's a dead person, uh, a deceased, who is autopsied, information is revealed and uh, there's an opinion that's given by the coroner or the coroner's deputy as to cause, manner, and uh, different information that's clearly testimonial in nature and is made with the primary purpose of litigation because someone has been shot dead, for example. And so, the, uh, and so what we have there is testimonial statements. In a case where the perpetrator is unknown immediately or in the case where um, it, for whatever reason the person may be known but there's not enough independent evidence to prosecute the person, uh, then uh, a decision to charge is not made until 20 years down the road and, uh, and the coroner may be deceased. The question becomes is that testimonial and is there any exception that would allow in through confrontation or through the rule of completeness or hearsay based uh, evidence rules to allow that to come into play. And I think that the simple solution to all of that is to videotape the autopsy itself so where you can see what happens. Um, you know Typical, I don't know of an autopsy where there isn't, there's a, there's a uh, camera and someone taking pictures of the reflection back of the scalp, for example, or the incision that is made and in, in the organs uh, removed, or the uh, pictures of the, the stippling of the uh, gunpowder that's there. Why can't you just substitute the, uh, the actual camera for a video camera? And so we, it can be saved into perpetuity now, any sort of statements that were made by the person to narrate the autopsy itself, I would suggest are testimonial in nature, uh, perhaps. Uh, but you mute it and you have the video and someone else in the future can rely upon it. And so therefore, uh, you know, you, you would 
be able to potentially get around this confrontation clause situation. If it's an apt solution for autopsies, then I don't know why, it's an apt, why it isn't a good solution for other venues of forensic science. Plus, it adds to a level of credibility and more particularly uh, making it so it's verifiable because a lot of times uh, cases um, will be litigated because the conclusion and the underlying acts of the analyst are not verifiable, meaning that there's no way other than the person say so that these events actually occurred or they saw these things. And if you can document it, show that there's no issue, no problem through its process, then you'll have less cases being litigated, I would suggest. And the ultimate conclusion to all of this is that if you don't like it, meaning the Constitution and the right of confrontation, you can always amend it. The amendment process isn't easy, but it's still an available to anyone who can muster the resources to get it done. So if it is a quote-unquote problem, you have that venue that's available to you. But otherwise, I suggest you take the words of the person who, in my opinion, has really developed the modern-day confrontation clause and presented it uh, into its modern form, who is Professor Jeffrey Fisher. And of course, what he said at the NCDD NACTL um, DUI, DWI seminar in Las Vegas this uh, past time through really rang strong to me, which is the government would save so much time, resources, and money if it had just acknowledged the right to confrontation and move on. I'm happy to present this information to you today. Hopefully it's sparked a greater understanding and interpretation of the Confrontation Clause. As with all things in life, these are my opinions based upon the information that you see there, and you should consider that I also have a bias in the fact that I'm a criminal defense attorney, meaning that I enjoy and I am proud of the fact that I represent the citizen accused or the person accused of a crime uh, in, uh, by the government. So you should consider what I have to say with a grain of salt, and perhaps a whole shaker. I've tried to uh, make my comments and my information here uh, objective and verifiable, but you sh there is no substitute for your own independent due diligence in <coughs> pardon me, in researching these matters, because uh, I certainly don't claim to have a monopoly on the thought of confrontation clause or present myself as anything other than an educated individual on, these, uh, on, these, on this whole entire situation. So I would commend to you to be involved in the science to understand it, to understand the confrontation clause, and hopefully today is the beginning of your further journey down the road of understanding the Confrontation Clause. I thank you for your attention.